What is normal? It seems like an odd question, but when people say they fear climate change, it implies that somehow we have substituted some abnormal condition for what was once considered normal. But what is normal when we talk of climate? Was it the 1940s when record numbers of hurricanes ravaged our shores, or the 1970s when hurricanes were oddly rare? When we say temperatures are higher today, do we compare them to the warm days of the 1930s and 40s, or to the cooler days of the Little Ice Age? And speaking of ice ages, are periods of glaciations just aberrations in an otherwise temperate world, or are our pleasantly warm temperatures a short hiatus between ice ages? Having only kept climate records for about a century, and having only really studied climate seriously with modern tools like satellites for a few decades, it is difficult to tell if we are experiencing climate abnormality or if change itself is the norm. In this short video, we can't possibly tackle all the issues associated with our changing climate. Instead, we will focus on just one aspect, man's burning of fossil fuels and his effect on global temperatures and the climate in general. We'll explore global warming theory and discuss why man's impact on global temperatures is probably less than is often reported. We'll also discuss whether trying to abate this impact by rolling back CO2 production is justified, or whether the cost of such abatement may outweigh any expected benefits. Let's begin by making sure we all understand the basic theory behind man-made global warming via greenhouse gases like CO2. The Earth is warmed by radiation and sunlight absorbed from the sun. But if that were all that happened, the Earth would quickly heat up to a point that it would be unable to sustain life. Instead, temperatures are kept in balance because the Earth radiates its energy back into space. As is shown in this picture, this radiation back into space occurs across many different frequencies. As this radiation is returning to space, some of it can be absorbed by various components of our atmosphere. These are called greenhouse gases. Water vapor is by far the most potent and the most prevalent greenhouse gas. Another such gas is carbon dioxide, or CO2, which is a relatively weak greenhouse gas. As carbon dioxide is added to the atmosphere, as represented by the pink layer in our picture here, some of the radiation returning to space is absorbed in the troposphere, that's the lower parts of the atmosphere, by the CO2. This raises the, the temperature of our atmosphere slightly. As you can see from the picture, only a fraction of the radiation is affected at all, since CO2 can only absorb selected frequencies. As CO2 concentrations increase, more radiation is absorbed but each subsequent increment of CO2 absorbs less radiation than the last until increased CO2 has almost no effect on radiation and thus temperatures since most of the frequencies that can be absorbed have been. This creates a diminishing return relationship between CO2 and temperature that we will return to later. So much for theory. What evidence do we have that this actually occurs? The best evidence comes from the laboratory. Even a simple high school apparatus, like the one here, can demonstrate the absorption by CO2 of certain frequencies of radiative energy, which in turn raises the temperature of the gas. This is settled science. What is not at all settled is just how important this effect is in the real, complex climate systems of the Earth. These are a few pictures that scientists have drawn to imperfectly simplify the unbelievable complexity of our climate. The Earth's climate patterns and temperature and precipitation are the result of an uncountable number of interactions, only one of which is the greenhouse effect of CO2. In fact, CO2 makes up less than four one hundredths of a percent of the world's atmosphere. This is a very small number, so small that if you were to fly from Los Angeles to New York, four one hundredths of a percent of the trip would not get you off the runway at LAX. So does CO2 matter? Let's consider an analogy. It would be undeniable to say that cell phones produce heat as they operate, but it would be absurd to say that the air temperature in a public building was noticeably determined by the number of people using their cell phones. So just knowing that CO2, like cell phones, can have some heating effect in the atmosphere is a long way from understanding how much of an effect CO2 has in a complex climate system. Those of you who saw An Inconvenient Truth may remember those really big charts Al Gore showed. The most impressive was this one, 
showing 650,000 years of CO2 and temperature reconstructions taken from careful analysis of ice cores. For years this analysis was the sort of empirical Rosetta Stone of global warming. It seemed to show a strongly positive, almost scary correlation between CO2 and temperature. It seemed to tell a story that not only is CO2 an important driver of global temperatures, it appears to be the main driver. If you have the chance to see an inconvenient truth again, watch how Gore presents this chart. The wording he uses to describe the relationship between CO2 and temperatures when presenting this chart is oddly vague. The reason for this is that by the time he made the movie, scientists tools for doing this kind of ice core analysis had become more precise. And what they found, time and again, is that while the carbon dioxide and temperature lines seem to move together, in fact, each upwards temperature spike you can see on this chart actually preceded the upward spike in CO2 by 800 to 2,000 years. Temperatures increased first, then CO2 followed a millennia or two later. Well, that obviously presents a causality problem. If this chart were proof CO2 was causing warming, then CO2, the CO2 spike would have to come first, but it doesn't. So what is really happening? It turns out that there are huge amounts of CO2 dissolved in the oceans. As world temperatures rise, oceans heat up and release some of this carbon dioxide, increasing concentrations in the atmosphere. Al Gore's chart actually shows that temperature increases have caused CO2 rises, not the other way around, probably by heating up the oceans. This ice core analysis, then, can no longer be considered the ultimate proof of carbon dioxide's impact on temperatures. It may still be consistent with greenhouse gas theory. Proponents, for example, argue that an initial temperature rise causes CO2 to outgas from the oceans, which then, in turn, accelerates the warming. This may or may not be true. We have no evidence one way or the other, just a lot of theoretical posturing. But either way, this chart no longer gives us any kind of real handle on the effect of CO2 on global temperatures. So we'll have to look closer to modern times for our empirical evidence. Since the